Hi, I'm glad you all could join us uh, today, and uh, we're very fortunate to have Danica Jordan, who's one of the original protégés of the ISA Mentor Program, and she really has been a uh, very enthusiastic participant and also uh, a guiding light in some ways. So uh, we uh, really appreciate her um, taking on uh, a WebEx here, and we're hoping that uh, leads the way to others uh, doing that. So I'm going to turn over the host opportunity to uh, Danica. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danica Jordan, and today I'm going to be sharing some of what I've learned over the last few years about vacuum systems, both troubleshooting them as well as trying to control them. In addition, I'll review how vacuum ramping can be done on batch systems, which are especially dynamic and pretty interesting control problems. So first, we'll review in detail how vacuum jet ejectors work, since that's what my work is focused on, both in the ISA realm as well as in the, the physical realm here at work, and some common issues that you should try to investigate first if your vacuum control is, is poor. Then we'll switch the focus onto a specific batch setup that I have here at my plant and what knobs that gives me to have available to, uh, to kind of turn for control. Then we'll look at the history of the control schemes that we've tried here at the site, focusing on what works and what hasn't worked, followed by a plan in my overview, a, a brief overview of my plans for, to further our, inform, our performance. Tripping up a little on words here. All right, so starting out, just adding out to the beginning, whenever you are out beginning, having a problem with a vacuum system or anything in, in general, you know, you really need to focus on whether or not you have an actual control issue or if it's a, a device issue. So a lot of the problems that I've seen and read about where people are asking them to improve the control are actually describing a problem with the device itself. So oscillations can be especially deceiving as they can be indicators of either control or the device. Uh, the moral here is just to start with troubleshooting the equipment before you dive down into uh, the deep tuning, just like you would on a control valve or other instrument. The hardware has to be working correctly for controls to be effective. If you haven't seen one before, Here's a picture of a few steam jet ejectors. These are commonly used to pull vacuum on a closed system, so like batch reactors that I have here on site. In addition, they can be used to recompress steam to higher pressures or even to condense steam. If you're familiar with the concept of a compressor, the way that these work and the converging and diverging design acts as a two-stage compressor but without all of the upkeep that you normally have with moving parts. This makes ejectors more reliable than a, vac than a vacuum pump system, at least in terms of direct maintenance, but they have plenty of system upkeep that we'll be talking about over the next few slides. So the way a steam jet ejector works is by creating a low pressure area inside the jet that suctions gas from the targeted vehicle. So first you inject high pressure steam which is also called motive steam in most applications, into an entry mixing chamber, shown here. The steam is going to accelerate through the converging, converging and then diverging throat of the jet towards the condenser. The acceleration of the gas creates a low pressure zone, very similar to how a low pressure zone is developed by air running over the top of an aircraft wing, which is what's actually creating the lift on that wing. So the force from this low pressure zone can be very significant, allowing you to reach some pretty high vacuum levels, or I guess low vacuum levels would be the correct terminology there. Low pressures, regardless. So the force of that pressure, or, you know, the, the low pressure area, the force that it's able to create is aided by the jet design in a couple different ways. I'll discuss them individually over the next few slides. But overall, the combined force of that acceleration is known as the compression ratio of a jet. So the vendor of a particular device will have this exact value of the ratio factor from all of their testing. Using this ratio factor and the discharge pressure of your system, it's possible to predict the suction pressure and thus the, the minimum vacuum pressure of your vessel pretty accurately. 
So you can see that in this bottom equation here, where your suction pressure is going to be equal to the discharge pressure divided by that compression ratio. So that gets pretty important as we start going in and looking at the details of individual vacuum systems. Since your suction pressure is kind of based on whatever that discharge pressure is, it's molded by that with that, that numerator, you can put multiple ones in line with each other in series in order to get a better overall suction pressure. So the discharge pressure here is what gives you the minimum level of both this suction pressure. Discharge pressure here to so this suction pressure, and so on and so forth. And so all of our systems, in order to reach the, you know, 10 to 30 millimeters of mercury that sometimes we're aiming for in a vacuum strip, we have, uh, we have to put several of these in series. Okay, looking at that suction pressure calculation in more detail, it's possible to go through and start optimizing things on your system. So as we just talked about, the discharge pressure has a tremendous impact. The minimum discharge pressure is going to be the condensing pressure of steam at your vapor outlet temperature. So looking at this here, whatever this temperature is at the discharge of that particular jet ejector, the condensing pressure, which you can look up on the steam tables over here at the side, is going to be the minimum suction pressure that you can achieve. So as your exit temperature starts to decrease, as it gets colder, you can achieve better and better vacuum on the system. It is uh, important to note, though, that, to note, though, that if you're below your jet's critical pressure, then reducing the discharge pressure further will not improve your performance. Generally, you can find the critical pressure in the spec sheets from an individual uh, vendor, but it's just kind of the best possible discharge pressure ratio that you can uh, get to on that particular jet. Okay, looking at that compression ratio, which we talked about back at the beginning, the compression ratio is created by the multiplication of two different boosts that are basically design considerations on your, your vacuum jet ejector. So the first is a sonic boost. If your vacuum jet is working correctly, the steam is going to be accelerated up to the speed of sound through the jet through that diverging or converging and then diverging section. So just like a, a jet, like you can see in the picture here, this is going to create a continuous shock wave that's adding power to, to your pressure pressure wave, and we call this a sonic boost. This is a on-off kind of thing. So you either are in that sonic boost range or you aren't. So you're getting the help from it or not. And uh, generally, that's why when you hear a vacuum system that's working well, the jet ejectors are going to be roaring pretty loudly. This is them being up at that that sonic boost range. So falling below sonic boost, boost is going to greatly reduce, boost is going to greatly reduce that R factor and is going to reduce your potential suction pressure. So and things to, to see whether or not you're in that sonic boost range are to look at your condensing, make sure that you have adequate condensing, and uh, check to see if maybe one of your jets is overloaded, if you have a series of them or parallel ones in place. So one jet in parallel with another might be hogging a lot of the load, and so your second lesser jet is down out of that sonic boost range. You can consider uh, turning it off completely and uh, putting that extra load on the, the heavy hitter at those lower ranges that you need. An interesting impact of the sonic boost failure, so if you get out of that sonic boost range, can be seen when you have cooling water temperatures that cycle through, cycle through, say, like a day and night, or summer and winter. In this example here, you see a jet is under sonic conditions at night when the temperatures are colder and the condenser is working really well. As the cooling water temperature starts to drift higher, and that's the decreases, 
the jet starts to oscillate in and out of that sonic boost mode, finally settling down at a, a lower suction pressure point during the day because the condensing is not working as well. Improve again, bouncing around, roaring and not roaring, in and out of that sonic boost. And as night falls and your cooling water completely cools down, then you'll get back into that higher performance range. So just something to keep in mind is that your condensers are very important to make sure that you maintain that sonic boost range. The second of the boosts in, in our little compression ratio is something called velocity boost. So a velocity boost exists because of the way that the throat of your jet diverges. As it opens up, velocity is going to drop and your pressure is going to drop, which actually adds to that low pressure zone that you've created inside the, the back end of your vacuum jet. Forcing and more flow throat is going to reduce the impact of this boost in a pretty nonlinear fashion. So you can see here we've got a given discharge pressure, and it shows the impact of reducing the vapor flow. This is both your steam flow and your process gas to the jet. So at the higher flows, a very small difference in the amount of gas flow that you're sending to the jet can have a pretty big difference on the overall achievable suction pressure of your vacuum system. We are able to manipulate that particular fact, you know, what we're talking about here, moving up and down on this range in order to tightly control where your suction pressure actually is. One of the, I guess, more ingenious ways that I've seen this done is to throttle additional non-condensable flow to your jet on purpose. So as you increase the amount of that non-condensable flow, flow, you're going to be overwhelming your condenser and reducing the ability of your jet to uh, reducing the maximum or minimum, say maximum, say maximum, minimum, reducing the amount of reducing the amount of vacuum that you can get out of that jet. So, and then by taking down your non-condensable flow, reducing the amount of nitrogen or steam or air that you're sending to it, you can then improve the flow, uh, the vacuum again. So, in our site. We don't actually have this additional non-condensable. We instead regulate the amount of process gas that's being sent in order to maintain better vacuum uh, pressures. A last note about troubleshooting of vacuum systems. Got a few things to check, like physically on the device. And the first is that you have dry steam. If you have wet steam, it is going to erode the throat of the vacuum jet ejector. And by eroding that throat out, creating the, the bigger hole in the middle, it's going to severely impact your sonic and your velocity boost. Unlike the picture that I show over here on the left, the wear can be extremely uniform. So even if it looks okay, it's worthwhile to kind of open it up and use a micrometer to actually measure the diameter rather than just for looking for obvious signs of wear. Similarly, dirt in the steam or process gas can foul up your jet, blocking the flow. Because of all of those calculations we just went through, having some dirt in there is actually going to improve your suction pressure over over the time and until you reach a point where something is physically blocked and until you reach a point where something is physically drops off entirely. So that's kind of an odd thing to, to watch for is if you're suddenly starting to improve how much suction pressure you can get and then it's just not working one day, but, you know, go in and check and make sure nothing is blocked up. Uh, similar to you getting dirt and things blocked in there, if you have the wet steam in a system like this where you've got a very, very large pressure drop across your throat, you can actually freeze some of the water out of your steam inside the nozzle, which will completely block it up and cause you to, to lose flow for a little while until the steam remelts it. So if you're seeing kind of an on-off getting flow and not getting flow through your vacuum jet, it checks to check whether or not you've got a, a lot of water in that steam. So since you could just be icing it and melting it over and over again. All right, so we're going to switch gears, switch gears a little here. Now that we've looked at 
some of the things that are important for the, the vacuum system. We're going to look more at the actual batch that we're trying to go through and strip out of using the vacuum system. So generally, a reactor cells cells with a combination of materials that each have their own vaporization, pressure, and temperature curve. So as you increase either temperature or reduce your pressure, you're going to start hitting the vaporization point of the lighter materials. So this is pretty simple here, and you normally don't go until everything is in the vapor vapor phase. But you'll hit just a vaporization threshold of one particular component along that pressure and temperature curve for its vaporization line, and sub subsequently hit, you know, some of the other thresholds. So all of that particular material is going to want to come out of solution at the same time. So say you have a 1,000-liter vessel with 10% water in it, 100 liters of that is all going to try and vaporize as soon as you uh, go above that vaporization point. So subject, of course, to mixing and mass transfer limitations. But hitting these thresholds, especially hitting multiple of them too quickly, is going to overwhelm your condensers. So controlling the rate at which you are passing through these vaporization thresholds becomes the goal of controlling a batch start. Okay, let's take a little bit more specific of a look at our system here. So in this uh, system, we have a reactor with a stripping column on top. This goes to a pre-condenser through a flow controller to our, our vacuum jet system. And the vacuum jet system has a condenser as well as a vac seal pot, so which all of your liquids will go down to the seal pot here and then out to the appropriate drainage area. Hot oil in a loop controls the temperature of our reactor. Our vapor is stripped out through that condenser. I think I just said all of this. I'll keep going here. <laughs> oh, and uh, we do have a cooling tower that we use to uh, chill all of the water going to the condenser. So originally, the pressure in this reactor was controlled by throttling the process gas gas flow to the vacuum system. This is a pretty simplified setup here. So we have the our pressure controller, our flow controller on the gas going to the vacuum system, which was controlling the amount of or the overall pressure in our reactor. But like I was trying to explain a, a slide or two ago, as you pass through those thresholds of the different components of the material all wanting to vaporize and then condense out, we were getting very, very high differential pressure across the column, and we were getting really high levels in the condensers. So, which was continuously failing or putting our batches on hold. So that had to be looked at pretty intensely. So looking at this, like I mentioned, you know, pressure isn't going to be the only thing important to you. You're also going to be concerned about the differential pressure across the differential pressure across the column. Because if the pressure gets too high, we could damage the column, or we could actually lift the packing out of that column and into the tea canner. On some of the other uh, other points of interest that are important for us to control, if the percentage of flammable process gas to your LEL header gets too high, we could have an explosion or a fire. And finally, I don't know if you've seen my previous presentation, but one of the more interesting things that we have here at the site is our cooling water towers actually have completely plastic internals. And so we do have trouble with hot cooling water return temperatures. If those get above a, a certain degree, then we actually start to melt our cooling towers, which in turn, you know, makes all of our condensing ability a lot worse. So these are the things that we're actually interested in controlling and making sure that they stay within certain limits. Now let's look at what we have available in order to control those variables. So we can turn the following knobs. We have hot oil flow, which we can use to change the temperature and push us, you know, back further on that vaporization curve for the, the temperature and, and pressure. We have cooling water flow and cooling water temperature, both of which are controllable. And then the main knob is still the amount of vacuum of 
flow that's going to the vacuum system. Okay, so we've discussed what we want to control, and we have an idea of what changes we can actually make on the system, what knobs we have. So when it comes to controlling the actual vacuum pressure ramp, there's a few standards which we've tried, I think all of at this point, on our batch system in order to have a nice controlled descent that isn't inefficient and isn't causing trouble with any of those response variables that we're interested in. The first and probably one that most people have heard have probably one that most people have injured. So the concept of the time ramp is that you have a pressure in your system that's going to be dropping at a very constant time rate. 10 millimeters of mercury every five minutes. That is how you would set it up. So in the code here, I show how a typical ramp setup we have. The enable ramp parameter is the one that we actually use. See, it's here and here as well. That is the code from the batch logic telling the vacuum ramp to go ahead and start running. So that's what kicks everything off. So this is how you can kind of communicate back and forth between what's going on in the batch and what's going on in the continuous control module. Overall, this style of ramp does not work very well for us because we were either ramping too slowly, you know, just losing a lot of cycle time waiting on this thing to ramp up, or we were ramping too fast which would result in us hitting multiple vaporization thresholds all together and overwhelming our condensers and, you know, putting the batches into to held for that high level. We did try multiple stage time, multiple stage time ramps where you would slow, you know, have a pretty brisk pressure drop and then slow it down as you knew you were getting close to a threshold. That way you could kind of, you know, more moderately deal with all of the condensables that are coming out of your batch at once. But we found that this was really, really subject to batch to batch variation. So if you were anything slightly different between the batches, then just guessing where the times would be that you would need to do the, the various pressure drops was not successful. So we, uh, we have abandoned that since. A second pretty common ramp is a DP ramp. So this is where you're trying to reduce the vacuum at a rate that maintains a constant differ differential pressure across your stripping column. The reasoning here is that a constant DP is generally indicating a constant vapor flow out of your column. So the condensers are unlikely to be overwhelmed by a sudden slug of flow. The primary problem that we had with this particular type of ramp is that our DP reading is or was, I guess both, entirely too noisy to control. So the DP would swing wildly, which would in turn swing the output on our vacuum flow valve. Filters were tried several times, but it was found, you know, after much digging in that we had an actual issue with the DP in instrument. So in addition, this method really doesn't help maintain the cooling wire temperatures below that melting limit that we talked about. So you can see here the pretty wild magnitude swings that we were seeing in the, uh, the DP reading and trying to control off of those was just absolutely impossible. Right. The final one that we, we tried out is kind of interesting. Uh, this was done prior to when I actually worked here, here at the site, at the site, but we've got some pretty good documentation on it. And basically what they tried to do was implement an operator's ramp, which is a, a series of kind of rules and batch constraints designed to watch the key response variables and mimic an operator's action to that, that particular uh, variable. So kind of like a so kind of like a poor man's fuzzy logic controller. Uh, for example, if the cooling water temperature increased, then the cooling water to the flow, uh, flow to the condenser would, would increase, and the hot oil flow to the reactor would decrease or completely shut off 
until that high cooling water temperature constraint went away. So, and it was just a series of these batch constraints all in line, kind of working together to keep us out of the ditches that we were trying to stay out of with our response variables. It actually worked pretty well, uh, but it was very, very unclear to the operators as well as the engineers that were trying to troubleshoot the system to tell what was controlling and when it was controlling. A lot of things were being done behind the scenes in the, the code to stay within these batch constraints, and just no one could really ever tell what constraints were in place at what time. So, again, this was also a pretty subject to variation uh, in the batch-to-batch. -batch. So, as things change, you know, the same rules might not necessarily apply in the same way, but there wasn't any way to deal with that with this type of logic. So moving forward, our main goal um, in the next few weeks is actually going to be putting in a working and dependable differential pressure instrument, since that is one of the key variables that we want to control. Uh, I actually think this presentation is going to be very helpful in persuading management that we've tried all of the cheaper options. So hopefully they'll be on board with us spending that money. Once we have a, a decent differential pressure reading for control, um, we plan to implement a new min-select logic control scheme. So the, the vacuum flow rate, uh, the vacuum flow valve is going to remain the slave, but the master controller will change to whichever of our master controllers has the lowest demand at that time. So that could be differential pressure, cooling water return temperature, condenser level, or reactor pressure. So this will allow the system to watch all of our important response variables with uh, the least confusion for the operator, since that's something that can be shown very easily on the, the display graphics that they have to work with. Okay. Here's some of the references that I worked with, um, especially the, the primary source here on the Working Guide to Process Equipment had a lot of really helpful information on vacuum systems that I've used over the last few years. and Please let me know if there are any questions. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation, and uh, I, I kind of agree with all the things you've gone through. I've seen myself. <laughs> uh, I I did put it in fuzzy logic, even though I'm not a big proponent of fuzzy logic, uh, and uh, just to try it out on some pH systems, and to my surprise, 15 years later, it was still in service, and it was, it was working sort of well, but they didn't understand it, and no one could tell <laughs> how to adjust it. That's maybe. exactly right. Exactly what we've seen here. So I, I worked with the plant to uh, convert it to uh, a, a model predictive control that would be much more understandable and capable of being improved. Um, your your ending solution uh, kind of parallels what I ended up doing on a batch reactor, well, doing uh, we call it override control, and uh, we do signal selection based on a bunch of uh, process variables, uh, you know, um, becoming constraints. And we started out actually uh, not knowing. Uh, uh, exactly what was important. So we started out with all the possibilities, like 10 controllers, and we got down to four. Because uh, what we could do is uh, very easily, as you say, uh, tell which one was being selected, and we even just automated that. And the time that a particular controller was selected during a batch, we uh, tracked that. And the ones that were <laughs> never active, we got rid of, and we got down to four, plus the, the one that's most active, you can kind of look at and say, well, you know, is something happening with that particular uh, measurement or equipment associated with that that is uh, causing somewhat uh, more of a problem where it has to take over more often? So uh, um, I, that, that's kind of a, an added bonus that uh, tracking the amount of time each one is uh, actually being selected uh, for them uh, improving the system. Uh, tuning it was uh, kind of a, a interesting, and I chose uh, 
this was uh, before Delta V, and so I chose uh, to go with proportion only control because I knew there were problems with integral control in the uh, old DCS uh, when you used override, and the solution uh, they found was about happening, I guess, after I put this in, uh, but they, they did find a solution for if, if you're using integral action in an override control. Um, but the way the solution was was to essentially do what we have already inherently in a new DCS. So um, the good news is uh, you can tune this uh, with uh, more than just proportional. I did, I used proportional derivative. You can use all three modes. And um, maybe a little bit of a challenge is uh, finding the time when you can uh, tune these controllers. Um, but um, there are some techniques we've kind of learned where maybe very quickly, um, you know, like in five or six dead times, you can find out what the tuning settings are from um, uh, some a step change, ideally in the output, but we can even sometimes um, do it by means of a step change in a set point. Uh, of course, I'm a big advocate of uh, doing simulation, and I would love to, you know, have a simulation uh, of it, and then if it's really a, a moderate uh, fidelity to high fidelity simulation, you can try uh, uh, out what the tuning is. And uh, see, uh, you know, develop a, a better understanding as well of what's going on. But very good. I, I kind of like where you ended up. I mean, there's also, you know, model predictive control, but model predictive control for batch operations is uh, kind of problematic because things are, the models are changing throughout the batch, and uh, there is uh, normally not a steady state. <laughs> And uh, all the things that model predictive control kind of likes, which is uh, why it's mostly used in continuous processes. Very good. Um, I appreciate you doing this, and nice, nice work. Well, thank you for uh, the opportunity.